All right. Good evening and welcome to the spring lecture series at SciArc. Tonight, I'm honored to introduce our speaker, Hank Ovink. And to introduce Mr. Ovink, I want to speak for a moment about innovation, innovative thinking, and uh, maybe surprisingly, the figure of Odysseus. And I guess this is my Eric Owen Moss moment where I get to invoke Odysseus. Um, for the students who don't know Odysseus, which are um, all of my students know Odysseus, um, you better know Odysseus. Um, we know of him through the epic tales of Homer. Odysseus is a hero, I guess, but not because he's strong nor really that brave, but because he's versatile, the Greek word uh, polytropos, and very, very cunning. He has metis, metis. And so Odysseus occupies the Western imagination not as an immortal god possessed of special powers, um, and this is an interesting argument among the Romans that he was supposedly the son of Laertes, or not, but as an entirely plausible human being who's somehow able to cross genres to great effect, so from battle to sophistry, for example. The same character pops up in Chaucer, then Shakespeare, then Swift, Jonathan Swift, not Taylor Swift, and almost always as a person, a person. Not always a hero, but almost always a traveler, rather capable of bringing canny solutions from one place to solve uncanny problems in another. In fact, it was Odysseus whom Le Corbusier evoked in his speech to the assembled Siam upon the launch of the Athens Charter in 1933, a perfectly reasonable document set forth by architects to answer the complexity of modern urban problems through spatial means. Le Corbusier at that time called Odysseus, quote, the archetype of human and divisive values for the architect. And while the image from uh, L'Architecture d'Aujourd'hui of uh, La Vie Reuse uh, is, um, appears to us now as a kind of fickle finger of fate, much maligned by our growing fear of master planning and heroic architecture, it may be more useful to imagine that hand as the Odyssean archetype, the hand of the versatile, that is the architect somewhat out of his element at the scale of the city, and the cunning, that being out of one's element allows for the freshest and canniest of solutions. And note that I'm not using the word clever. I think that we as architects all harbor a secret belief that if given the chance, we could find an innovative solution in almost any field, and that this is not hubris or myth, but an intrinsic part of architectural thinking and architectural knowledge. I like to think of Mr. Oving along these lines. He's a trained architect, solidly within the architectural discourse, the editor of Design and Politics, an educator everywhere from the Berlaga to UDEL, Harvard, GSD, Columbia, to name a few, the organizer behind the 2012 Rotterdam Biennale on Making Cities. At the same time, Mr. Oving's sense of space and his ability to articulate his architectural feel for space and design into real planning solutions has made him very successful as an urban planner, whether on behalf of the President's Task Force on Hurricane Sandy or as Deputy Director of Spatial Planning in the Netherlands. When the waters inundated New York during Hurricane Sandy, Mr. Ovenk turned disaster into design opportunity He's principle of rebuild by design, a proactive embrace of the rising tide, and number one on CNN's top innovative ideas. A versatile and cunning exemplar of that which catapults us from myth to reality, from the speculative to the real. Please join me in welcoming Hank Ovink. That was the best introduction ever. Ah, thank you. Um, OK, we'll, we'll, we'll move to, uh, uh, from this to uh, this. Um, uh, this is your beach, uh, Venice Beach. 
uh, supposedly when climate change is real. You never know. Um, that's the other side of climate change is, uh, uh, is not water, but is drought and the, the, lack, of, the lack of it. And uh, as you can see, uh, and there's going to be another image where red is actually not <clears throat> where red is actually not the good color. Um, and if you overlay that with uh, demographic changes, and it's interesting, this study done by the Urban Institute show, shows there's, a, there's growth in Los Angeles, but they, they have three scenarios, and the other scenario is actually that there's like decline of population. So you never know what's gonna happen. But it puts a lot of pressure on the, on the city, on the region, uh, overlaying climate change with demographics and economics actually puts you in the, in the frame where I'm gonna talk about a little. Uh, and I'm gonna focus on uh, how design and design thinking and the uh, process uh, around that ha can have a transformative capacity, a real transformative capacity on the ground for people, uh, for politics and policies, uh, and, uh, and in the end also for the places. Talk about water a little. Uh, people feel climate change uh, uh, mostly through water. The impact of water uh, and the changes around water issues around the world being droughts or uh, surges and storms and sea level rise uh, impacts uh, 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 the best, the most tangible and tactile when it's related to water. Uh, there's an inten in intensity growth when it comes to water related issues, but also if you look back over the last decades, 90%, which is like a, you know, I always think it's a big number, 90% of all uh, uh, of all disasters worldwide are water related. So there's a, uh, an impact of water and uh, looking ahead, two to four billion of the world's population will be affected by water in the next 20 to 50 years. So that's two to four billion and that could be drought or the quality of water or, or too much of it uh, by surges and sea level rise. Two to four billion uh, people affecting uh, in those regions, uh, up to 20% of their regional GDPs. So we have huge numbers when it comes to water, 90% risks related, uh, two to four billion, 20% of their GDPs, uh, uh, and it's a, uh, it's a lot. This is a, uh, another image, a city a little north of uh, LA, where the AT&T Stadium uh, actually will, will flood. And this is um, like Miami, a city where developers uh, have a short frame uh, when it comes to return on investment, uh, and climate change has this long frame when it comes to impact. So you can build anything in Miami, uh, while actually in Miami is the new Atlantis. Um, and uh, if you look at San Francisco, you can also build anything in the floodplain, uh, when the only thing they take care of is uh, earthquakes. Uh, but uh, as you can see, um, climate change will actually affect uh, a lot. Popular science, uh, it's not real popular, but this is a National Geographic, uh, shows that the impact of sea level rise and surges and water uh, on our cities and urban regions is uh, also very economic. It's this, this month issue, you can pick it up at the bookstore. Uh, and look at those cities. Uh, pretty dominantly, uh, predominantly, uh, also U.S. cities. Miami is number one when it comes to uh, uh, the dollars at risk. Uh, New York, three. New Orleans, four. Um, and even my Amsterdam uh, is in this list. And I'll get, I'll get to uh, the reasons why. So, not for nothing, the World Economic Forum, uh, this group of organizations, governance, governments, businesses, NGOs, uh, activists that, that get together in Davo every year in January uh, and try to agree and talk about uh, the world's most pressing issues. World Economic Forum put water crises as a number one risk, risk when it comes to impact. So the world is acknowledging, there was not a lot of attention on it. Water is not so sexy, but the impact is tough. Uh, we're doing research uh, with, uh, for instance, the World Resource Institute um, on what that water risk actually really means, because you can talk about it in the numbers, uh, but you really have to understand 
with scarcity, safety, and quality risks when, it, when they're water-related R. Uh, and this is only one map I show, and again, red is not the good color. Uh, uh, this is not the place where you want to be. Uh, but there's another part of water cities discovered over the last decades that it's a connector uh, in urban place uh, for urban development, the renewal of former harbor and uh, coastal areas. Uh, and of course, water is a necessity for our industries, for our, our chemical industries, our food industry, for human beings. Uh, without water, uh, we have a problem, but the quality of water, the added value, is actually addressed now by uh, economists, and they can actually calculate the added value water brings to our, our urban space. Not when a storm hits. Then it doesn't bring that added value. Uh, it has a devastating power. So water uh, uh, has this attractiveness, and at the same time, this huge power and this huge impact. Uh, and these are images uh, from uh, uh, 2012, October 29, when Sandy hit the New York, New Jersey uh, coast. Quote by a friend of mine who works in uh, the Bay Area, a research and policy and activist group called Spur, uh, and he actually says climate change, is that there's a problem to it that it's so slow. Uh, and, you know, in the U.S., in, uh, uh, we uh, joke about that climate change is even slower than Congress, which would, you know, would actually be very slow. Um, but uh, it, it is a problem that the slowness of climate change has a hard time relating to the, the way we, for instance, run for election. Almost every year you have to vote. Uh, and every two years, or uh, at least every four years, there's a change in the way our places are governed, are led uh, in, uh, in our cities, our states, our counties, our regions, uh, but also in our industries. Uh, and then you need to have long-term decisions, these 100 years uh, uh, decisions where you know that sea level will rise if you look at 50 or 100 year, but you know, as I said, in Miami, the developer doesn't care because after 15 years, he, he, he's gone and, and, and uh, the building will be wasted only afterwards. Now, President Obama under, understands this uh, as a, a world leader when it comes to climate change, and he, he wanted to put it, on, put it on top of his agenda in his first term, uh, but he didn't. Uh, we didn't hear him uh, a lot in his first time on climate change. Uh, he was definitely busy with other, with other things. Uh, uh, and not for nothing, because climate change is hard to grasp. It can be very abstract. Uh, now he's dealing with the Congress, and the uh, chair of the committee in the Congress, con Congress when it comes to climate change is Mr. Inhofe. And he just said, um, I think a couple, two weeks, three, four weeks ago, that actually we, you know, we can't do anything. It's, God, it's in God's hands. Uh, now, if climate change is in God's hands that, you know, I don't know, will be saved or not. It depends on how you interpret the Bible or uh, other religious books. But uh, this cannot be our, the way we give over. Uh, but this is actually what, you know, this is the political this is the political condition where you are all in. Uh, uh, so we have to find a way out. And it's going to be tougher. I know. We're only here. There. If you look at this graph, um, and when it comes to uh, solutions and, and policies and frameworks, we tend to look back because looking back actually is you know, it's comfortable but uh, tough enough. But if you look ahead and you uh, add climate change and sea level rise and surges and demographic changes and economic changes, uh, the uncertainties are growing. Uh, and it's going to be very hard to actually uh, turn that into an asset, turn that around. World Economic Forum turns those risks into risk report. Uh, and the right side of the slide uh, shows that frequency and impact of future risks are increasing. So both the free, so we get more and it's getting worse. Eh? It's the, the, the popular language. 
Uh, knowing that it's getting more and worse uh, is actually the, the bad side of the future. The right side of the slide shows that there is a clear interdependency between those risks. Climate related, water related, man made, environmental catastrophes, you know, uh, economic downfall, terrorism. There is a clear interdependency between those risks. And that interdependency, and now it's getting interesting for us, uh, that interdependency mostly surfaces on the regional urban scale. A scale where we work, a scale where we apply our design thinking, our planning thinking, our, our, our way of intervention. So if the scale where their, their interdependency occurs is the region, is the uh, city, then it gives us the opportunity to mitigate and adapt uh, towards those risks. So the right side of the slide, although it shows the complexity of the issue, is also actually the way forward. This is going to help. So when Sandy hit, and it hit uh, the New York, New Jersey region hard, uh, President Obama understood uh, there was an opportunity. Uh, now, Sandy was not the worst storm ever. We have seen worse storms in Asia and the Pacific uh, and in other places, uh, causing more death and more damage. But Sandy had a, uh, a nice thing to it. It hit New York. Now, everybody knows New York. Uh, if you talk to a kid in Mumbai or Cape Town or Sao Paulo, there's always a story to tell. Either he's, he or she's been there or parents or seen a movie or there's a song about it. So all of a sudden, this great city, uh, this world, this global city, got hit by a huge storm and it raised the awareness of the impact of climate change to our societies, to our communities, to the people. Uh, and in that sense, had the opportunity to grasp and move forward. And this is what uh, the president immediately understood. Sandy showcased, was actually a showcase of the World Economic Forum Risk Report. It showed the interdependencies on the regional scale and the way they're actually affected, uh, in this case, by sea level rise and the surge. Power supply in the New York region, 75% in the floodplain. Uh, fuel storage, 80% in the floodplain, 20% just adjacent. So critical infrastructure, uh, totally at risk when you look at the future. Uh, the left side uh, shows the connection between uh, social vulnerability and physical vulnerability in the US, in Europe, in Asia, in Africa, and South America. Poor people live in poor places. Everywhere the same. So when you have it hard, a storm hits you harder. And it's even harder to get up, uh, get your feet back on the ground. I was here right after I was touring the region, but uh, specifically it's purple, so this is where. Uh, uh, surge and, and, and uh, social vulnerability uh, come together. This is Newark, industrial facility. The water was uh, uh, halfway this, this room uh, during the surge of Sandy. Uh, you're young, most of you, but perhaps you know what Agent Orange is. Well, they stored it there. Um, social housing, low-income housing, chemical facility, they had to close the playgrounds at night. The playgrounds for kids. They had to close the playground because the soil lit up at night, a neighbor said when we tore it. And I don't know if the soil actually lit up, but uh, they actually closed the playgrounds because the soil was so contaminated, it was really dangerous uh, to touch. Uh, those low-income houses, uh, people cleaned the basement with buckets. So I don't know what kind of disaster climate change brought together. So again, an example of the World Economic Forum report that the risks are connected. Uh, and of course, that's the opportunity, but it's also devastating. Sandy showcased uh, and surfaced, surfaced questions on social and physical resiliency in the region. It showcased their interdependencies, uh, taking out the Conet power plant uh, in Manhattan, turning Manhattan in a two-neighborhood zone, a NOPO and a SOPO, uh, north of power and a south of power. Um, and that in a region that is totally fragmentedly governed, a region where different governors from 
different political backgrounds actually have to deal with different constitutions and a fragmented political society. Uh, fragmentation that makes it very hard to really get to solutions and implementation and where implementation agencies like the Port Authority are hijacked by politicians. Uh, reform of those organizations is actually blocked by the guys on top. Uh, and in this, this devastating situation of huge numbers, 650,000 houses lost, hundreds of people killed, uh, hundreds of thousands of businesses uh, 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 stalled, uh, uh, with these interdependencies and the damage of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, over 60 billion, Congress agreed uh, to, to appropriate $60 billion for the rebuilding of the New York, New Jersey region uh, after uh, President Obama installed the Hurricane Sandy Rebuilding Task Force. So we have huge devastation, a big storm, uh, all these vulnerabilities and big numbers coming into this big region. But then you... Then you walk in that region, and then you start to talk to the people that are affected. And then, you know, my thinking as a, uh, as a politician and as a designer uh, is to think about the future, you know, to come up with solutions or ideas and processes. Uh, but the people in that region, families that lost their daughter, men and women that lost their businesses, their houses, sometimes friends or family. These people don't want to look forward and be innovative and think, wow, climate change is cool, you know, let's do something. They want to go back. They want to go right back to what was lost. They want their daughter back, their house, their business. So if you want to do something in a region that is so devastated and impacted by, in this case, a storm. You can't bring in the 60 billion like a hero, uh, uh, 60 billion of salvation, or 60 billion of design thinking. You actually have to touch the ground. You have to start to understand the culture, not only the culture of the place, but the culture of after a disaster a post-disaster culture, because it's different when you lost your wife right after Sandy and you have to rebuild your house. Do you want to rebuild it? So thinking about solutions starts with thinking about the people. So the momentum, in a, you know, there's this saying, never waste a good crisis, but wasting a good crisis is actually easy uh, and not wasting it is very tough because it demands real, real understanding of that crisis on every scale, human until regional, uh, scientific until social. Uh, so the only way you can actually use that momentum is by real understanding. Now, luckily, President Obama um, appointed Sean Donovan as chair of the Hurricane Sandy Rebuilding Task Force. Now, Donovan is a, a born and raised New Yorker, uh, he was at that time uh, Secretary of Housing and Urban Development in DC. Uh, uh, born and raised New Yorker, uh, an uh, architect by training. He's a GSD grad, so not a SIAR grad, but you know, uh, at least he understands uh, uh, practice. He married a Jersey girl, a landscape architect. So they, the two of them actually really know the region. He was commissioner on the Bloomberg, so he knows the politics. He worked for Cuomo at HUD so he knows the politics. Um, and now he's uh, uh, at OMB, uh, Office of Management and Budget at the White House. So when President Obama wanted the right man or woman for the job, picking Donovan was actually the right choice. But Donovan is also a politician uh, uh, that wants to know what he is responsible for. And he knows everything about housing and design and the region and the politics and uh, the policies and the finance, but he, he understood that he didn't know so much about water. So he went to the Netherlands. Um, and uh, he was on vacation in Berlin right after Sandy, and he called, gave me a call, and I was at that time uh, uh, 
amongst other things, Director General for Spatial Planning and Water Affairs, so responsible for the country's planning uh, as well as for the country's water safety and quality. Um, and why the Netherlands? Exactly because of these images. Uh, and the middle one uh, is from the 1500s. Um, and I, I, always, I, I always like to look at such an image and think if you would project 17 million people on that image, which is actually the current case, um, and you would do a cost-benefit analysis uh, from a developer's point of view, you would, you know, you would say move to Germany or something. You know, uh, uh, Germany is our neighboring country, um, and um, but we didn't because why not? Um, we didn't project 17 million. We started to build our cities, cities on the crossroads of infrastructure, which is like the normal thing, and part of that infrastructure was water, uh, uh, and water actually brought us to New York uh, and to other parts in the world. Uh, it gave us the opportunity to grow and to prosper, uh, raise our kids and, and, and grow business. But the delta, uh, the Netherlands is, also brings prosperous soil so we can raise our crops and uh, cattle uh, and build great landscapes and cities uh, right on this cross. So the soil condition as well as the economic condition of such a network position on the edge of the delta is great. Uh, uh, so we build our country, but we had to turn the, land, the water into land. At the current times, only 29% uh, uh, of the country is above sea level. So the rest is uh, below or at, and uh, two thirds of our country is living there and 80% of our GDP is earned below that sea level. That means something because you have to turn, you have to manage that risk. You have to manage that water. So we built polders, parcels of land uh, around a dike uh, or a dam, and we pumped the water out to keep dry feet. Uh, now, it's uh, easy. We have 22,000 kilometers of dikes in the Netherlands. Uh, we manage them uh, uh, and, and maintain them in a certain way. We have over 3,500 of those polders, and that Sounds, you know, that's the showcase of an engineering and design job, but it started with collaboration. It started with people. It started already in the 1100s, where we build our water dem democracy based on the collaboration of people. People got wet feet, 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 wanted dry, wanted to raise their kids and build their houses, and needed to collaborate, because if you build a dam around your house, the water goes to your neighbors, and then you are, you're in trouble, so you want to do it in a collective way. And that's not so much socialism, but it's, you know, it's sanity. Um, and um, might be socialism. But um, in the 1100s, we organized ourselves around. We elected officials. We paid taxes. And those water boards, as we call them, are still there. Uh, we had over 300. We merged them into 23. And they take care of the water safety uh, and water quality uh, of the country. And we build the land through those water boards, uh, turning those polders into prosperous places for our airports, our uh, cities, uh, uh, and our uh, citizens. That didn't make us always safe, because at being at such risk uh, also is vulnerable. And in 53, and I could name other storms further back, but at 53 we had our big sandy, uh, almost 2,000 people got killed in the Netherlands, and the southwestern part of the Netherlands got totally flooded, as you can see. And it made us remember how vulnerable we are. And we responded uh, in uh, engineering as well as in a governance way. Because yes, you can protect, but you also have to live with the water. You can't only build a dam, a dike, or a levee. You have to plan your cities your economy and your ecology around that water, and you also have to be prepared for failure. So living with water is not about fighting it. Uh, like the bottom one would be fight the water. Uh, if you do this multi-layered multi approach, it's really about uh, embracing the quality and uh, uh, risk that water can actually bring to your country. We institutionalized it with a Delta commissioner uh, who's uh, 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 by law granted a position 
There's a fund of a billion euros every year that goes into the safety uh, uh, and the development of our, our water, uh, water management system. And we just came up with a, a new Delta program that guides us for the next 100 years. And our Congress, in October, agreed to lengthen the budget until 2050. Um, and we didn't talk about it in the Netherlands. It was not a discussion. And I think that's weird. Uh, but Donovan, touring him around for two days in the Netherlands, showcasing him how we work with water, how we govern it, and how we finance it, and how our policies were, and uh, how our interventions on the urban, local, as well as regional infrastructural scale are, said, hey, it's cultural. This is Rotterdam. It's cultural. Um, and he asked me the question, can it be cultural in New York? Hank, how can we make water part of our culture, uh, part, of, part of the thinking uh, of our future? In a country that is guided by this Center for American Progress study, in the 80s, uh, a little over uh, 10 billion, now almost 100 billion, Congress, government, puts into the response of disasters. And this is only repair money. This is band-aids. Uh, so this is not about preparing yourself, your communities, your cities, your regions for the future. This is about repairing the damage that's done. So the 60 billion was calculated on repairing the damage of the, uh, of the Sandy affected region, adding up to that, 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 that high number we have now. And every year it's increasing, but it doesn't raise awareness and that you can do it differently. And this is a very conservative study. It says that if we would do it differently, we would invest $1 in prepare, we would save $4 to the dollars. Now, we have studies now that it's actually $7 uh, to the dollars, but even in this conservative study, any economist uh, would judge that that is a good idea. But if you don't, and you have a national flood insurance program uh, funded by the government, then this is the response. Because uh, this is exactly repair. You build houses on stilts, so next time a surge comes, you don't have wet feet. But that doesn't increase the quality of the place. That doesn't increase your uh, ability to uh, uh, address future thinking. So Obama said to Donovan, uh, we need time to think. We have to invest in a process that is future aimed, uh, dedicated to the future. So while the president developed his climate action plan, we with the Hurricane Sandy Rebuilding Task Force, I joined, uh, 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 Secretary Donovan asked me to join it, build a rebuilding strategy. And um, uh, he wanted me to work on the long term, uh, the regional and the innovation. Uh, and uh, I was struggling with it within government because uh, I don't know how many of you know federal government um, from the inside. It is a funny place. Um, so if you want to make it work uh, towards uh, innovation, regionalism, and long-term thinking in collaboration with states and cities of this region that was so balkanized and the way it's governed, you have to think of a list, it's a Dutch word, a trick, uh, uh, a Trojan horse. Uh, and I, in a certain way, was you know, being detailed over from the Dutch government to the federal government, a little part of that strategy, uh, uh, trying to figure out from within uh, what uh, change could mean in thinking, in policy thinking. So. I came up with some principles. Uh, you need a safe place, uh, a place that everybody can join, uh, a process and a place that everybody can join, where it's not about the nego negotiations between federal government and cities and states, uh, between government and NGOs and community groups and businesses, because the distrust in the society is big. We had a meeting with investors in New York and Donovan gave the talk about the task force, and the first question he got, well, Secretary Donovan, we like you, we know you, you were a great commissioner, but federal government sucks, it doesn't work, so why do we trust you? So you have to create a process and a place where people are able to invest in, step over their biased, biased thinking, uh, and, 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 
and put in their, you know, their, their heart and their minds. So not only uh, that, so that they don't get to negotiations, but you have to create a safe place. You have to create a process to that place that is like a sabbatical detour, a little sidestep out of the institutional world, a sidestep that makes it possible to infuse thinking, to infuse innovation, where, where first ideas are not hit by negotiations or political boundaries, but actually can be discussed, and vulnerabilities and interdependencies can be discovered. We have, you have to broaden the frame, because the political frame is a day-to-day -day frame. They have every politician in the US or anywhere around the world has to deliver on a daily basis. But you have to infuse that frame with thinking of the past uh, and at the same time develop the scenarios and the future thinking uh, to make it a rich frame. This, these politicians will not change. They will still decide uh, from day to day. But it's up to designers and innovators and policy makers to create a, an environment where that decision is actually infused by real knowledge and understanding of both the past and the future. And design can actually help. Design is a way of connecting the technical aspects uh, on how we build and develop and do things uh, with the opportunities because of these interdependencies, the opportunities, the development of our cities, our places, our communities, our houses actually bring and add ambition from both a political as well as a community and scientific level. If you look at the future and you embrace NCIP, NCCP reports or World Economic Forum reports, you use the needs of the community, the local needs that that match scientific with real local uh, uh, with real local knowledge, you create an ambition, and design is able to not only bridge those gaps but actually merge those three perspectives. And there's like nobody there. Uh, there's no one leader, no hero, no uh, 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 president or chair or principal that is really uh, that it's really about. This is not about uh, stars. Uh, uh, oh, perhaps it's about a thousand stars, but you have to forget hierarchy in such a process. You have to always take a step back. And then you can create a process and a place, a situation where the talent of the world, talented scientists, talented designers, talented thinkers and activists and politicians are meeting the talent of the place, the region, uh, the communities. And that are not perceived talents that went to GSD or SciArc, uh, but they went through Sandy. They lost their daughter, their business, their house, but they are dedicated to stay and to rebuild, and they have knowledge of that place, of the history, uh, and they bring in a community need and an understanding that no scientist, no architect or politician can actually bring. So, matching that talent of the world with the talent of the region uh, by collaboration. Remember, collaboration is key. It's about people. Uh, uh, and you need a leadership that is truly inclusive. And what I mean by that is government, but also businesses and scientists, have a tendency to say, let's think about amongst ourselves first before we start to talk to others. So government would say, well, close the door, because you know it's vulnerable to go outside. Uh, so if we know what we're doing, then we can talk. But it doesn't work. It's a failing strategy, because one group of actors can never think of a solution. You always have to do it together and infuse that knowledge with the knowledge of others. So inclusive leadership means the door is always open, even for those that are too late. Uh, there is no way you can judge if somebody is or is not in that room. So the process we created had to be inclusive. So that meant for government that they really took a step back and invested in a place that really was about trust. Now that became rebuilt by design. So the outcome of these principles and the need of the region created the opportunity to do something different. 
Uh, and I called it Rebuild by Design. Um, now, Rebuild by Design was a competition. And competitions in the US are institutionalized uh, by the White House, the Office of Science and Technology Policy. There's an America Competes Act, which is a law. Uh, actually, President Bush started that law. Uh, and it says competitions are a great instrument for innovation. But those competitions actually are um, uh, based on the principle that you know the problem, you throw the problem in society, and then you, you, you wait for solutions. Um, and I said, that's not how it's going to work. Because we have to start uh, by first getting a better understanding of the region's risks, vulnerabilities, and interdependencies to get to possible opportunities. So first, we need that better understanding. And there's only one way, I said, to get that understanding is by inviting the talent of the world and matching that talent of the world with the talent of the region. So the first step was a call for interdisciplinary teams. Uh, so we did a call, not for uh, proposals, but a call for qualifications. Uh, and teams had to be interdisciplinary but also had to have an opinion what interdisciplinary actually meant. Because it's a cheap word. You know, I've got friends that are designers, um, and we have offices, and we drink. So before you know it, you're an interdisciplinary team at a night and say, let's join for the Sandy Task Force competition. But I wanted, in the brief we put out, that they actually had an opinion why this group they put together, this interdisciplinary group, actually mattered to the issues at stake in the region. So they had to take a stand and say, in relation to the ecological uh, questions or the economic questions or the small town communities, the Jersey Shore, or big city urban questions of New York City or, or water-related infrastructure questions, we build a team of activists and scientists and designers and planners and politicians even, or artists and, and, and communication and process managers. We build a team uh, that they can actually deal, deal with these, these questions we will put on the table. So part of the RFQ was a real ask of understanding what was necessary, what type of talent they could bring to that table. And then the, the we did the call on the June 20th, 2013. July 19th, the submissions had to come in. The morning I had two. Um, Liza, my assistant, opened the email account, rebuilt by design at hot.gov. And uh, she had two. Um, this is, of, I, and I know this, of course, you always do it in the last, uh, you know, the last hour you submit your proposal. But when you're in charge, all of a sudden, that's not such a funny thing. Uh, uh, so, uh, Secretary Donovan uh, called me and said, hey, Hank, you know, it's 8.30, how is it going? I said, I have two proposals. And this sounds funny, but it's not a lie. I'm, it's really true. I had one proposal from a concrete company that sent in their PDF. Interesting stuff, but it's got nothing to do with resiliency or sustainability or climate change. And the other was from an artist from Arizona. Uh, during the day, Proposals trickled in, but in the last two hours, we got in total 148 proposals from all over the world. Uh, 30 countries, 50% uh, uh, of all the states of the United States were presented in the proposals. And the task force uh, put in a team of specialists and selected the 10 best teams uh, out of that 148. Um, and we brought the teams together. Um, and we brought the teams together uh, and discussed the competition. And my first line with the teams in a, in a room like this, because we had uh, 200 people in the room with these 10 teams. Uh, and I said, the competition is over. You won. Because this competition is not about one winner with a project in a museum. This competition will be about a true understanding of this region's vulnerabilities, and building on that true understanding, we will get to coalitions of community groups and mayors and designers, uh, and you will develop solutions, proposals, projects, and the best of them will be selected. And it could be one or 10 or something in the middle, 
depending on how well you will perform. So you will not compete against each other, but you will only compete against the highest bar. And because you're all different, I said, uh, I want you to collaborate because the engineers on all these teams can actually help infuse thinking on engineering. And the landscape architects and the architects and the urban designers and the politicians and the activists. So next to a team effort, we needed a collective effort of understanding. So we embarked these teams on a process of research. We toured them around the whole region and they met with over 500 uh, organizations in that region during those months. In every place in the region, we toured them with buses and trains and cars and even with bikes uh, around the regions and met with the mayors and the community groups and the citizens that were affected by Sandy and they talked. And they started to build an understanding of the region's needs and they started to build an understanding of the vulnerabilities. And of course they had the understanding of IPCC reports and World Economic Forum reports and their design thinking but they started to build a different understanding of regional vulnerabilities. And as a result of that research, teams presented one research uh, as 10 teams, uh, uh, facilitated by New York University's Institute for Public Knowledge, but also each of the teams presented three to five design opportunities. Opportunities where uh, those risks and vulnerabilities came together uh, on a scale that was you know, manageable uh, city, urban, neighborhood. Uh, and we selected for each team one opportunity and then teams started to design. No, then teams started to build a coalition. These teams were so eager to design, but we had to stop them. So they started to build a coalition and with that coalition of community stakeholders, uh, they designed the best proposals always in line with that regional research and then presented it to an international jury uh, in April, and we selected six winners out of 10. So that's the process, a process where regional thinking and a regional analysis and a regional approach met the very local need. A clear need driven by climate change and sea level rise and storms and surges and economics, social and cultural issue, matched with a clear local need bridged by a process that started of understanding, funded by philanthropy, so not federal government, uh, but philanthropic organizations like the Rockefeller Foundation, the JPB Foundation, Surtner, and others, small foundations as well as big foundations to fund that process, partnering organizations like New York University and the Regional Plan Association, Municipal Arts Society and the Van Halen Institute, a federal task force uh, with all those agencies, as well as grantees, so local and regional jurisdictions like the state and the cities. And 10 teams with over 250 professionals of this broadest scope possible, an international jury, and in the end, the promise of implementation dollars, the promise of a billion dollars or more or less, depending on uh, what the need of those proposals would be, the promise of disaster recovery dollars, uh, provided by the federal government to actually implement that fund. Ten teams uh, in the region, uh, and these are the teams, uh, ten teams that worked on architecture, on landscape architecture, on urban issues, on planning, on the regional scale. Uh, uh, ten teams that connected the politics of these big guys uh, with the community need, uh, with the community understanding. And they use design. They used your language, your expertise, uh, as a way to get to solutions. Now I have a question. How much time do I have? Um, ten, ten okay. I'm going to pick three projects for the ten minutes um, out of the ten, and the rest is on the website. Uh -huh. uh, this is a Manhattan, Central Park. This is a team led by MIT, Zus and Urbaniston. Uh, um, uh, and they worked on the uh, regional approach of the Meadowlands. Uh, now the Meadowlands is the, it's not the best place of, it, you know, it used to be the best place of New Jersey, but it's uh, pretty much contaminated. Uh, the ma mafia 
buries their bodies in the swamps. Uh, it's where the Sopranos actually live. Um, and the surge from uh, the ocean came all the way here. So all these communities here were flooded by the surge. Now this used to be a great swamp. And a swamp is not only has a great ecological uh, asset, uh, which is a necessity for an environment, it also has this sponge structure. So it can actually hold water in a different way uh, than concrete does. Uh, so what MIT came up was rethinking the regional's vulnerability. And this is, you know, this is the Agent Orange side I went. Um, rethinking the regional vulnerability by turning the, uh, uh, the problems of the region being social and ecological and contamination and economic uh, on its head and saying if we can rethink the quality of the place by uh, installing a berm uh, that is multifunctional, that can carry a BRT system uh, and that is flexible, uh, we can um, mitigate uh, uh, contaminated sites, turn brownfields into uh, uh, swamp structures again. If we can, at up till a certain level, uh, increase the volume uh, of development around that new infrastructure, we create a, uh, an opportunity for new development within limits uh, that also creates a, a great place uh, to live again. Uh, so reuniting the ecology with the economy. And this is, it's big as a scale, but on a, on a human level, it's very small. So the only thing you do is reorganize houses and businesses, add a little volume, and that creates enough opportunity on a, on a meter by meter or a kilometer by kilometer or mile by mile way uh, of, uh, of thinking. I'll skip this one. Uh, Ome, uh, with Royal Haskoning, uh, worked on Hoboken. Uh, Hob uh, on the other side of the Hudson is Manhattan. Hoboken used to be an island, uh, so this was swamp. Uh, the Dutch actually did this. 75% uh, of Hoboken is in the floodplain. Now that means that when there's a surge, 75% is flooded. Uh, but uh, Hoboken is also a city that is uh, totally hard, has a totally hardened public uh, surface. Uh, and the sewage system is old. So a little rain also floods Hoboken. So Hoboken has rain events and therefore flooding events every other week. Uh, so the problem in Hoboken is not only that on the north and the south side, the surge gets in with a sandy storm. It has a problem in the urban environment, not enough green space, uh, 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 a bad system. So Team OMA said, we're not going to uh, only protect the si city. We have to look at the system. So let's resist, delay, store, and discharge the water, meaning that, yes, we have to work on green infrastructure and gray infrastructure on the north and the south side to protect the city for flooding. But we also have to work on the, uh, the whole surface of the city, greening, greening space, uh, uh, making sure that water is delayed once it hits, uh, and um, investing in the sewage system, and then store it uh, using a, a park and a new rail infrastructure uh, as a uh, storage capacity uh, and as an asset for development because it creates a great urban space and then invest in the new pumps uh, to discharge it. So this comprehensive approach uh, uh, builds in uh, safety for the whole of Hoboken. Now, to add to this perspective is that FEMA ruling says that critical infrastructure, there's a wastewater plant here and a hospital and an energy facility, uh, those critical infrastructures are flooded and then you get money from the federal government to protect them, like little islands. You can't use the money to protect the whole of uh, the city of Hoboken. So Mayor Zimmer from Hoboken, of Hoboken always said to FEMA, if I, the dollars I get for protecting these facilities, if I can invest them here, I can actually you know, protect the whole city and therefore the whole uh, community of Hoboken. Now, with, uh, the, uh, pro uh, with the proposal all may put on the table, we can actually do that. We can actually change federal regulations and 
invest the dollars in a different way. Um, uh, interesting, um, very regional. This is Manhattan. All of a sudden, we zoomed out. Uh, this is uh, New Jersey and Long Island. Uh, this is uh, WXIY West 8. Uh, they came up, and they're still studying, uh, because it's huge and massive and very complex, with a regional approach, and said, let's suppose if we can build new islands uh, uh, offshore, islands that actually can help reduce surges. Uh, so they will not change sea level rise and climate change effects, but they can actually reduce the surge. If we could build this whole set of islands, then the impact of storms, normal storms, as well as sandy storms, the impact on the coastline will be lessened. Uh, and that means that you save a lot of dollars. It's a $35 billion proposal, at least, and the calculations thus far. Uh, and the research is uh, ongoing. Uh, Interborough team worked on um, uh, Long Island, uh, room for the river. A lot of the, the coastline of the US has perpendicular rivers. And these rivers are urbanized and uh, frac fractured and fragmented. So they don't hold the capacity anymore to store and discharge water. Uh, uh, the team uh, took one of those rivers, the Mill River, uh, widened uh, uh, the stream, uh, connected it again with the other streams in uh, this part of Long Island, raised in that sense the capacity to store the water with any water event, rain or surge, and then build a set of sluices, uh, uh, little dams, uh, in the riverine system. Also using a, a Bay Park, the Bay Park facility, which is a water treatment plant. Um, uh, the outfall is now in the bay. They use the, will bring the outfall upstream, so the water system it, itself can actually be the ecological engine again. Uh, skip this, and then uh, the big team worked on Manhattan. Um, uh, this, this is the part of Manhattan that got flooded, uh, uh, 57, West 57th Street until East 42nd Street. Uh, and the report Mayor Bloomberg put in place after Sandy said we have to protect Manhattan. Now, uh, you can do that with big infrastructure, um, uh, but big infrastructure has this Moses, Moses type of approach. And so the team said, actually, we have to marry Robert Moses with Jane Jacobs and, and uh, the the, the child of the two will actually be the way, you know, we all would like to be child of those two perhaps, uh, would actually be the way to move forward. So what they did is, yes, we need protection infrastructure, but we don't know what it is. So let's go community by community, street by street, block by block, sometimes family by family or community group by community group, investor by investor and rethink what that local need in those different communities is. Now, this is the Lower East Side, which is a totally different community because it's all social housing and low-income housing. And this is the West Side that is, you know, uh, in the upper regions when it comes to uh, value of land uh, in the United States. You will come up with different uh, ways of uh, reducing risks here and there. In the end of the process, they worked uh, with the Lower East Side community uh, uh, on creating a berm uh, uh, that actually uh, is on the, uh, this is the berm on the edge of the FDR uh, and creating the capacity for more bridges uh, to connect this community with the park, um, and, and this is the park, and therefore with the water. And the berm in the end could also actually be covered, uh, so you could actually get, get rid of this uh, Robert Moses infrastructure. Um, In June, we allocated $920 million to implement the first phases. Uh, right now, action plans of the states and the cities who are responsible for implementation are being approved by HUD. And implementation will start this year uh, of some of the projects. Rebuild by Design was built on inclusive leadership, true collaboration, and innovation and design. It brought cultural change by that same design. Uh, and this is an image of the the jury process, where one team, well, all these teams brought their coalition partners. But this is the Penn Design Olin team. They brought 75 people to the jury meeting. Uh, and those were all members of the community, businesses. And, and Hans Point is the uh, 
food market in New York without Hunts Point. New York City is without food in one and a half day. But Hunts Point also, eh, the, the other 50% of this peninsula, has the poorest zip code uh, and the highest asthma rates amongst kids in the whole of the US. So this economic asset has a, a big social question. And the team brought those groups together through a design process and design thinking. And they all came to the during meeting. We built by design infused federal government to rethink their policies and I developed a national disaster resiliency competition to increase innovative thinking uh, across the US in 67 places that got wasted by disasters in the last three years. And I worked with USAID uh, on a process where uh, the rebuild by design method, this sandwich of collaboration, uh, actually now tries to build resiliency in the Horn of Africa the Sahel and Southeast Asia. So I think it's fair to say that Rebuild by Design was in the end, not about a project or a plan or a process, but about a cultural change. Thank you so much.